Hello and welcome to an India Today special broadcast that comes to you from the strife-torn Ukrainian capital Kiev. I'm Gaurav Savant. This is a city on edge. There is panic, there is apprehension, there is fear. But there is also a steely resolve that Ukraine will not give up without a fight. Over the course of the next one hour, we will also tell you about casualties that are taking place in the strife-torn second largest city of Ukraine, Kharkiv and pain that's hit closer home. An Indian student was killed in the crossfire when Russian forces targeted Kharkiv. This young Indian medical student was on his way to pick up essentials, food and water at a supermarket when he was killed in a Russian attack. We bring you this ground report. A 21-year-old Indian student has paid the price of being a civilian stuck in a war zone. Naveen Shekharappa had left the safety of his bunker to buy provisions. He never returned alive. War takes its toll on the innocent bystander. The guns do not know who their targets are. Bullets shot out of barrels make no distinction between foe and bystander. Oftentimes, it is the innocent who pays the price of anger, hate, belligerence. I can say with trembling of the heart that the first patient I operated since the beginning of the war with Russia was a six-year-old boy with a shrapnel wound in the neck. Death comes from above, early in the morning, without cause, but for a reason. The Russian invasion force is seemingly using cluster bombs in Kharkiv residential blocks. The devastation of non-military targets apparent in the debris of its aftermath. As the invasion turns increasingly brutal, the resistance of ordinary, unarmed citizens in Mufti gathered determination. When the target of occupation is the city itself, then increasingly the blown out shutters, the crumbling masonry, the charred shells of once ordinary habitat records the progress of war or its stalemate. The slings of a hundred puny Davids, 21st century Molotov cocktails to defend against the Goliath invader. The successor state against whom the cocktail was first used. History loops around another all-powerful aggressor and the fiery stand of the weak commoner. On foot, by road, on trains, anyhow they can, the objective is to somehow go away, to leave the violated land. Suitcase in tow, children on their lap. Mothers have no option but to seek refuge. The future of their children are at stake. If they live, they will have a tomorrow. War, the misery of it. Deep crimson of blood splattered on the whiteness of disturbed snow. Information is sketchy. There are the dead. They no longer speak. In the haze of exploding war, winter in Ukraine has come to stay. There were about 16,000 Indians, especially students, mostly medical students who were trapped in various cities. 9,000 have now made their way either to the border or out of harm's way beyond Kyiv. But that would indicate that at least 7,000, around 7,000 students are still waiting to get out of harm's way. One of the coordinators told India today that there are more than 3,000 students who are still trapped in Kharkiv, the second largest city. India today's Nabila Jamal spoke to some of these students who are hiding in bunkers. There is no electricity. 
there's often no water. How are they surviving? Take a look at this ground report. Afreen Sultana is joining me from Ukraine, Kharkiv. Afreen, we know that you're really scared, worried and shocked with Naveen's death. Um, and we understand that several students are now panicking and they're leaving their bunkers. They're headed towards the railway station. Give us an insight. Where are you? Show us what's behind you. Actually, we are in a bunker. This is our, uh, let me show you. Uh, this is our bunker. This is the entrance uh, from the flat. And here is the situation of our bunker. This is one of the log kills here. And okay. Uh, when first we came, it was very unhygienic and the temperature was slow down. There is no heating systems here. And uh, here we're staying. It's like this is a current situation. We are here. We used our blankets, uh, which was available for us. And here we are staying. Some of the students are um, again there. And uh, it's like it's a, it's a very vast bunker. And uh, we have water and everything which is set up here only. And uh, there is no light okay. out from here. And it go goes on like that. How, how many of y'all are there currently? Currently, we are seven. So there are seven students here, Indian students, and the rest is locals and Ukrainians. And, and you showed us, you showed us the local there. The local is guarding. Uh, he's guarding you. Is he the one no, uh, no, that no. you're using for communication? No, no, he is just a local staying here. How do you feel, Afrin? We know this is devastating to hear that one of your own uh, an Indian student, Naveen, has uh, died. He's also a medical student, just like you. You're a medical student. How long have yeah, you been there, and what? What's the reaction of students now after hearing uh, Naveen's demise? We are literally panicked because there are some of our friends who went out and bring uh, like when the uh, actually the supply is very short and we have to go out for food and water. So it's like we are literally scared and don't know what to do. And when you hear like pa parents are also very panicking about the situation. And we can't like we can't literally sleep because of these sounds. Every second we are hearing the bomb shellings and all. It's very terrific. Is there a window outside uh, from your bunker there, Afreen? Can you see anything? Can you show us once again? Is there a window that you are able to see no, no, uh, of the outside? No, no. What do you know? No window. Uh, it was uh, that we have a one window, but it is closed because. Can, can, can we see? Off. Can you show us around? Yeah. It's like this is the window we have, but it's closed because it's very dangerous for us to. You know, uh, the chances of attacks are like. Literally, see, we are so yeah. in car, very so it's like closed. There are no windows, it's like closed doors and all. Yeah, everything is shut. But, but uh, do you know that uh, Russian soldiers there are on the streets? Do you yeah. have you been told or are you hearing it? What kind of knowledge do you have of what's happening outdoors? Because you're saying six Out days you've stayed inside the bunker without stepping out. So, how do you know what's happening outside apart from the sounds that you're hearing? We are communicating with our guardian. Uh, so he is like giving us information about this curfew and also shelling. So he keeps us informed that this uh, from this time to this time you're having this curfew and this time to this time you should go out or stay home. And uh, we have having like Instagram and videos are still coming up. Tell me about your friends and uh, we understand there's a lot of panic that's gripped the student community, Indian students particularly. Yeah, it's it's like after this death and all. Uh, in the morning, it was a ray of hope was there. After the embassy announced the like uh, evacuation will be as soon as possible, but after that, mm -hmm. uh, all the situation got frozen up like very fastly, and our friends were literally running to the stations, railway stations, and catching the train and go going to the borders. For uh, students in Kharkiv, it is very difficult to go to the borders. It's like thousand four hundred kilometers away, and it's very risky right. for us to stop out and travel. It's very risky. If you are running out of supplies, is there a way that you all can leave from there and move? Do you all have the courage? Can I see your supplies? Can you show me what, what you have left of uh, the last week? Uh, last week? Uh, no, it's like only bag and uh, some popcorns are left. Like I'll show you. Yeah, please. If this is what we have left off. It's just like a, a snacks and all. And we have a water, mm. which is like this. Uh, we have two uh, two cans uh, only. Mm. Mm. Two cans of water left. Do you have, what about money? We understand that the cards are not working. ATMs, yeah. none of that is functional. So how are you dealing with that? Have you tried? 
uh in the first day of the war like we went to the uh, atm and there was still a, a very big queue we tried but mm. uh, cards were declining and we went to the shops uh, on the first day we collected the items using our card like swiping and it's mm. done we na- we haven't gone out ta- got out since then so it's like we don't mm. know like next step we don't know how to do it because we don't have any kind of liquid amount with us it's it's only in the card which is not mm. working no no, no cash on you at all no you know really you're being so brave and i really hope you know that the indian government also is doing its best they're trying to reach out to people uh, in fact the embassy there is also trying to reach out to many of those agents you said one of your agent is also in touch with the indian government yeah. and any word of assurance that you've heard from them we, you do know that four union ministers are also along the border areas uh, from india yeah. to try and speed in up the evacuation process it's like navy is waiting for us uh, like uh, air forces are like uh, literally uh, trying to get here in the karki airport it will be launched uh, uh, so it's like uh, there was a good news in the morning but we don't know when mm. it will happen we hope that is mm. as soon as possible that we we literally want to get, just just want to get out of from this mm. you say seven feels- of you are there yeah go on six days feels like six years like it's li- literally time is not even like even if we sleep for uh, some time and we look at it time is not running even you know like it's literally going slow and so what about electricity what about uh, your connectivity there uh, your wifi i know now your wifi is strong but otherwise i is it it's all connected are you able wifi, to access there's no wifi we we are charging we have taken a new sim and we are using mm-hmm. that but it, it's like for uh, uh, we have like a 5 or 6 gb for three of us um, i don't know mm-hmm. when it will be going to shut down on our charge also it is very uh, dangerous for us to go up and charge it. so it's like we switch off mm-hmm. our phone for so many mm-hmm. uh, like how so many wake up we use it for 2 to 3 hours and then we switch it off again it's like we oh gosh it. Uh, it can hmm. be like uh, it can be ha- it can happen any time. We have to expect hmm. it, and there will be blinking of lights and all shaking, vibrating. Hmm. So it's like we, we all are expecting it, but still, that was hmm. a condition. People who are with you at that moment, seven of you all staying. Anybody else who is behind you? Would you want to show us? Uh, How are they actually, coping? First, uh, three, uh, four of four of them have been gone, uh, like to inside of the uh, bunker. Uh, I can't show. right now but here are two of my friends who are sitting here yeah 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 uh, can you ask them if they're doing okay how are they holding up yeah i can wait for a second yeah we are okay <laughs> thank you for asking yeah we're just calling you know, out your smile means a lot that oh. really shows the amount of courage that both of you have yeah. uh, have you all communicated with your family Yeah, yes. we all communicated. Yeah, they are also in panic. So we we have to yeah. keep us. Yeah, we have to be brave enough to keep our parents happy and don't make Fabulous. them so. Yeah, and that's that's exactly what you're doing. And I think y'all are giving us strength. And I hope you know that the Indian government is really stepping up efforts. Uh, they're doing all that they can. Uh, but we all have the courage to move towards the border areas. That's where the evacuation process will begin. It's it's already begun. It's underway. But you'll ha- will have to get to the border areas. Is there a way and means for y'all to reach there? You'll have the courage to step out of your bunker. It's been a very bad situation. Yeah, yeah like the morning out. incident of one of our friends passing out, like literally making a drop in a car or something. So we can't take the mm. risk to. Yeah, we have to go actually about six days. Yeah, and stepping out means there will be some risk or something. Yeah. That much risk and. put our parents in a you know, dilemma or something yeah yeah no to completely understand what your parents must be going through but uh, you you must hold on i think you you are doing the right thing by not breaking down not panicking the situation further but uh, afreen was telling me there are several indian students out of panic after hearing navin's death who stepped out and have rushed towards the railway station is that true yeah, so yeah they all flew and they were just calling us and just saying that just come on just go run they were like we were like oh, panicked but we can't do anything you know your your smile has given us so much courage it really I, i'm sure people who are watching and your families particularly who are watching uh, will will feel stronger now just to see the fact that you're holding up so well
Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate that you're uh, speaking to us. And I'm th the only reason to why we're uh, connecting with you is so that uh, those responsible authorities watch you and hear what you have to say. And of course, your families know that you're safe. Mm -hmm. And be rest assured that the Indian government is going to reach out to you at the earliest. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Afrin. Really yeah. appreciate you talking to us and just hold up and keep that smile on, yeah? Yeah. Thank you. You'll be fine. Yeah, thank you. Day 6 of operations and the Russians have systematically targeted Kharkiv, the second largest city in Ukraine. They didn't succeed earlier. An assault was made, but the governor of Kharkiv claimed that the city had been cleansed of Russian soldiers. This time, Russia attacked with all its might, including using ballistic missiles that caused massive damage to a government infrastructure. Unfortunately, an Indian student also lost his life. But Kharkiv today is battleground between Russia launching the attack and Ukraine defending this city, perhaps to the last man last bullet. Simultaneously, there is apprehension that Russia would now target Kiev, forcing many to leave the national capital. Kharkiv is bleeding. Ukraine's second largest city is being pounded by Russian forces. This 20-second video shows a Russian cruise missile hitting the central square of Kharkiv. The explosion around 8 a.m. on Tuesday came hours after a curfew was lifted, say local officials. It left a huge crater on the ground and inflicted heavy damage right outside a government building. Devastating images started coming in minutes later, revealing the true extent of the destruction. The missile strike came hours after massive shelling and rocket attacks on the city of Kharkiv. These images of burning homes and buildings reduced to debris are only indicative of the devastation faced by Ukraine's second largest metropolis. According to the Ukrainian government, even residential districts of the city have not been spared. This is terror against Kharkiv, terror against Ukraine. There was no military target on the square. The rocket to the central square is outright undisguised terror. No one will forgive. Nobody will forget. This strike on Kharkiv is a war crime. Nearly 500 kilometers from Kharkiv is Ukraine's capital city of Kyiv that's bracing for a big attack. Air raid sirens blared in Kyiv through the day, sending panicked residents into bunkers and bomb shelters. There's an air siren going on. There's an air attack expected now. Maybe a bomb attack expected right now. And that's an indication that is telling people to take shelter. Go for some kind of bomb shelter right now. And this is an indication. This is going on continuously now for last five minutes. After Monday's inconclusive peace talks, massive Russian reinforcements are advancing towards Kyiv. Satellite images show a 65-kilometer-long Russian convoy of tanks and armored vehicles heading to the city. The photographs also show deployment of ground forces and ground attack helicopter units in southern Belarus that could be pressed into service later. Everyone is watching what's happening in Kharkiv. Everyone's watching what's happening um, in some of the other localities. And the apprehension is very soon that trouble could come here. If you just look on the road, uh, it will take us just a moment to show you uh, what's happening there. That's the barricade. That's the main barricade that leads into Kiev. 
Ukraine is getting aid from many of its allies who are unwilling to directly join the war against Russia. The country is set to receive 70 fighter jets from the European Union. Bulgaria is providing 16 MiG-29s and 14 Sukhoi 25s, whereas Poland will provide 28 MiG-29s. Slovakia will also pitch in with 12 MiG-29s. The European Parliament on Tuesday gave a standing ovation to Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, who addressed the gathering virtually from Kyiv. As Ukrainians continue to resist the Russian invasion, President Putin could adopt an even more aggressive approach to orchestrate the fall of Ukraine's capital. Please stop. With Gaurav Savant and Rajesh Pavar in Kyiv, Bureau Report, India Today. Is Russia now all set to target Kyiv? Satellite imagery shows a 64-kilometer-long Russian convoy comprising tanks, armored personal carriers, troop carriers and a large amount of logistics chain inching forward towards the Ukrainian capital. The question is, how is this moving forward virtually unchallenged from the skies? Is this then an indication that the Russians now have complete air supremacy and the Ukrainian Air Force is unable to target this convoy. Also, what about the unmanned combat aerial vehicles that the Ukrainian government was talking about? How soon will Russia attack Kiev remains the big question. The first round of talks between Russia and Ukraine ended inconclusively. Even while the talks were going on, the satellite images released by Maxar Technologies showed a huge Russian military convoy making its way toward the capital of Ukraine. Earlier, the convoy was thought to be 27 kilometer long. Maxar Technologies' latest images say that the convoy stretches 64 kilometers from start to finish. The images are from the north of Ivankiv a city roughly 80 kilometers from Kiev. Houses and buildings are on fire, while the large convoy, sometimes in double row, is seen passing through the highway leading to Kiev. The column stretches right up to the Antonov airport. One of the satellite images show a damaged bridge in the vicinity of the moving convoy. The convoy is protected by the artillery cover near the airport situated in the town of Prybursk. They are just about 29 kilometers from the Ukrainian capital city. Since the beginning of this Russian assault, Ukrainian forces have defended the roads leading into central Kyiv against assaults by the Russian forces that are massing around the capital. On the fifth day of this war, Ukraine's defense ministry released footage of the apparent aftermath of the Russian shelling on the town of Okterka in northeastern Ukraine. This town is nearly five hours' drive away from Kyiv. Latest satellite images reveal additional Russian ground forces deployments and ground attack helicopter units in the Boklov area in southern Belarus. Boklov is less than 32 kilometer north of the border with Ukraine. Russia has unleashed deadly arsenal against Ukraine. Ballistic missile, cruise missiles and now a vacuum bomb. Ukraine has accused Russia of using a vacuum bomb on a civilian target leading to widespread casualties. The vacuum bomb is considered the deadliest after a nuclear weapon. It sucks the oxygen out of the atmosphere leading to widespread casualties, damage, burn injuries. Worse, this was targeted not at a military installation but caused widespread damage in a civilian area, resulting in fatalities. We bring you this report. There are bombs. And there is father of all bombs. If you think that the Russians would not get overtly brutal in the ongoing war with Ukraine, 
The scale of aggression here will make you think again. The much feared vacuum bombs have allegedly made a devastating appearance in Ukraine war theater. Russia has been accused of using the much reviled bombs by the Ukrainian envoy to US. Ukraine says Russia has dropped two vacuum bombs in Okhtarka Samska region. These bombs are capable of vaporizing human bodies in seconds. They are shooting us with missiles, ballistic missiles. Uh, they use the uh, vacuum bomb today, which is actually prohibited by Geneva Con Convention. So, you know, the devastation that Russia is trying to inflict on Ukraine is, is large. The vacuum bomb works by igniting a fireball that sucks in all the surrounding oxygen to generate a high temperature explosion. The blast waves singe everything inside leaving no chance for any living being to survive. Russia was accused of using the vacuum bombs, banned under Geneva Convention during the Second Chechen War. America too used the non-nuclear bombs in Afghanistan against ISIS. Ukraine is now gathering evidence to drag Russia to the International Court of Justice and begin a trial against Putin for war crimes. Bureau report, India Today. Will the Turkish unmanned combat aerial vehicles, the Turkish drones, Bayer Actor TB2, prove to be a game changer? Now, Ukraine claims they're using disruptive technology to beat supremely powerful odds, the Russian army. One instance has been put out in social media by the Ukrainian government where they claimed that a Turkish unmanned combat aerial vehicle went and destroyed a Russian missile carrier, destroying multiple tanks and armored personal carriers. The question also remains that should they have this technology, why is it not being used so extensively when this kilometers long convoy is inching forward towards Kiev, threatening Ukraine's national capital? Is this more about information warfare, disinformation warfare, or are the Russians being drawn in closer before these unmanned combat aerial vehicles are used? We bring you another report. Perhaps the most compelling aerial image of Ukraine's counter-strike on its invaders. Look carefully at these infrared images. What you're looking at is a Russian missile position being struck from the skies by a Ukrainian drone. The drone said to be raining this hell on Russian forces is the Bayraktar TB2, a combat drone fleet supplied by Turkey in 2019. These drones carry four laser-guided missiles that have proven highly effective in combat. The TB2 has a flight time of 24 hours and a communication range of almost 185 miles with a service altitude ceiling of roughly 25,000 feet. Additionally, some of these drones create a disturbing sound when approaching their targets, which can be psychologically unsettling. The chief of Ukraine's Air Force, Lieutenant General Mykola Oleschuk, describes the Bayraktar TB2 drones as life-giving. Each Bayraktar TB2 system consists of six aerial vehicles, two ground control stations, three ground data terminals, two remote video terminals and ground support equipment. Bayraktar TB2 UAV can carry a maximum payload of more than 55 kilos. The standard payload configuration includes an electro-optical camera module, an infrared camera module, a laser designator, a laser range finder and a laser pointer. Ukraine is the latest instance of these formidable attack drones in action. Bayraktar TB2 drones were heavily effective for Azerbaijan against Armenia in November 2002 as testified by multiple videos that emerged at that time. A precursor to this was the success of the TB2 drones against Russian-made weapons in Syria and Libya. 
key aspects like low visibility and detectability thanks to the low radar cross section makes this drone slick and agile it is interesting to note that earlier this year turkey and ukraine had an agreement in place to co-produce bayraktar tb2 drones at a production site in ukraine Ukrainian Defense Minister Olesi Reznikov told reporters in Kiev that the co-production compound would also include a training center where Ukrainian pilots would be trained. This had caused a lot of resentment and anger amongst the Russian defense establishment back then. And with the drones striking russian targets once again now expect things to escalate further from the air with sai kiran kannan in singapore bureau report india today ukraine is uniting perhaps like never before to take on russia there are breweries that are no longer manufacturing beer because they want their bottling facilities to be used to make molotov cocktails or petrol bombs there are volunteers who are coming forward leaving their day job leaving the everything else to help make these molotov cocktails to target russian tanks and armored personnel carriers there are also those in dnipro for example who are organizing blood donation camps helping pack food packets and everything else that soldiers at the front may require and now this battle is not being fought at some distant front it's being fought in streets and in neighborhoods now approaching kiev the ukrainian capital there is fear in the air the russian attack on ukraine especially the capital kiev is it likely to happen in the next couple of hours is it happening tonight or perhaps in the next 24 to 48 hours we are tracking that story very closely a quick break back with lots more international pressure now mounting on russia but is it working we'll tell you on the other side of these messages Stay with us here on the special broadcast from the Ukrainian capital Kyiv. Despite security crackdown on thousands of Russians who assembled at St Peter's Square and in other cities in Russia to oppose the invasion of Ukraine, the sanctions are beginning to have its impact on the people of Russia. There are long queues outside ATM, there are shortages that are being felt. We bring you a ground report from Russia but the question still remains will is this enough will it turn people in Russia against president vladimir putin's invasion of ukraine or is this something that he has already factored in and the invasion will continue the offensive against kiev will continue remains the big challenge the big question <laughs> The people of Russia are paying price for Vladimir Putin's war. And a heavy price at that. The US and European Union have cut off a number of Russian banks from the main international payment gateway called SWIFT. The SWIFT ban is the harshest economic sanction against Russia. Equivalent to restricting internet access to a nation's finances. Moscow's residents are bracing for a grim economic downturn ahead. Our economic situation will get a lot worse. It is inevitable in these circumstances, but it is still not comparable with the losses who are dying in their homes through the fault of our forces. We are in touch with our Ukrainian friends and I have no words that could comfort them. Ordinary citizens got a taste of the future hardships on Monday. Hundreds queue up at ATMs to withdraw cash as popular online payment apps failed. long queues were seen at metro ticket counters as well the russian ruble plunged 18% against the us dollar on monday and the central bank hiked its key rate to 20% in an emergency move to shield the currency 
Но у меня накоплений нет. I don't have any hard currency savings. Let's see what happens. Пока сложно что-либо сказать. It's hard to say. I haven't felt much difference yet. The sanctions are widely expected to hit the economy hard. It could make matters worse for regular Russians. Compounding years of stagnant or falling real wages as well as driving up prices. Prices are rising, of course, savings are shrinking and stocks are falling. The protests against the war witnessed on the first two days seem to have lost steam. There is no polling data yet on the public's view of Moscow's invasion. But President Vladimir Putin's ratings are high and many people are thought to support it overall. While Russians queue up outside ATMs to collect their cash, it is yet unclear how the dynamics will play out. Will it undermine support for Putin or rally Russians around the flag? Bureau Report, India Today. The world is mounting pressure on Russia to stop. The question is, is it working? 29 countries have now put a ban on the overflight of Russian aircraft. In a tit-for-tat move, Russia too has banned its airspace for airlines from 36 countries. The question remains, are these tactics working or is it time for the world to do much more to prevent the escalation of this war? India, of course, has constantly been talking about dialogue, negotiation and a negotiated settlement. But take a look at the pressure that's being mounted on Russia. Is it working? Let's find out. Just when the airlines industry was structuring a revival from the pandemic, the latest economic war between the West and Russia is seeing it hit a major air pocket. In a tit-for-tat move, European countries, Canada as well as Russia, have banned each other's flights over their airspace. A look at this screen grab from the flight tracking app FlightRadar24 shows just how effective the airspace restrictions are. Flight traffic over Russia is a fraction of what it used to be. Dozens of flights have been cancelled. Hundreds have been rerouted, adding miles to their routes, hours to their flight time and a massive amount to their fuel bills. Particularly affected are the flights between Europe and East Asia which normally take the Russia route. Carriers have had to divert flights south while avoiding hot zones in West Asia. Interestingly, the sanctions may also deplete the fleet strength of Russian airlines. 777 of Russia's 980 passenger planes are on lease. Of these, 515 are from foreign aviation lessers. Not only have the lessers recalled their aircraft, they have little chance of being paid the monthly installments because of the sanctions. The biggest impact, however, will be felt by the already stretched supply chains across the globe. Covid had already slowed and disrupted cargo movement and the fresh sanctions will hit the sector ever more. Nearly half the cargo is moved by air and Russia is a major intersection for global trade. Lufthansa Cargo has said it will no longer use Russian airspace. Air France, KLM, Finnair, Virgin Atlantic all have stopped North Asian cargo operations. UPS and FedEx have also halted deliveries to Russia. According to an estimate, airlines responsible for moving around 20% of air cargo are affected by the bans. Air freight charges, which were higher by 70% on year in January, are expected to rise even further. Curiously, the US is still to restrict its airspace to Russian flights. It has, however, already asked its citizens to leave Russia immediately. Bureau Report, India Today. The world is mounting pressure on Russia to back off. It's not just economic sanctions, it's not just banning the overflight of Russian aircraft, but even in the sports arena, pressure is being mounted on Russia. Countries are banning Russian sportsmen. Federations are saying Russia is no longer welcome to play. But is this enough? Will banning Russia from global sporting bodies actually have an impact? Will it deter Russia from 
intensifying its operations, especially when it's all set to target Kiev. Our next report tells us more. The sanctions continue to mount. Russia is now facing the biggest boycott in decades. Vladimir Putin's aggression has come at a huge cost for his nation, with Russia now facing unprecedented isolation from the sporting community. The invasion of Ukraine has sparked massive sanctions. Russia has been expelled from the 2022 Football World Cup in Qatar. After being suspended from all international competitions, FIFA and UEFA announced in a joint statement that Russian clubs as well as the national team will not be allowed to participate in their tournaments. The development comes after Poland as well as the Czech Republic refused to play with Russia in the World Cup playoffs. UEFA also announced that it was ending its partnership with Russian state energy giant Gazprom, a deal that was due to run till 2024 and cost around $40 million a year. The Champions League final that was slated to take place in St. Petersburg was also moved to Paris last week after the invasion of Ukraine. Russia was dealt another body blow after the International Olympic Committee recommended banning Russian and Belarusian athletes from all sporting events. The executive board's recommendation means Russia and Belarus may not be allowed to compete at the Winter Paralympic Games in Beijing that starts this week. In fact, the IOC also recommended taking away all the hosting rights from Russia in the near future. Only last Sunday, the International Judo Federation had suspended Vladimir Putin as their honorary president. With sport federations, even bodies, all cutting ties with Russia amid worldwide condemnation and sanctions from Western countries, the World Motorsport Council has called for an emergency meeting on Wednesday. The move comes after Formula One announced that it is stripping Russia off from holding the F1 race in September this year. The clamour to ban Russia and Belarus continues to grow, with the West calling for an outright ban on all sporting entities and events related to the two nations. The boycott Russia is facing is similar to what Yugoslavia faced in 1992 after war in the Balkan region. Similar to what happened with South Africa during the apartheid years. And one thing's for sure, Russian sports will continue to suffer if the war does not end soon. Bureau Report, India Today. Kiev is a virtual ticking time bomb. People in Kiev say this is tinderbox Ukraine. The attack could come anytime. Those who could leave have left the city. There are others who say they will continue to live in their city till their last breath and continue to fight. Last man, last bullet. The India Today team, cameraman Pavan Kumar and I will continue to report from Ground Zero. But that is all that we have time for on this special broadcast from Kiev in Ukraine. Many thanks for watching.